Welcome to Growing E-Commerce. I'm your host, Mike Ryan of Smarter E-Commerce, also known as SMEC. Today, we're joined by Catherine Monroe, a data scientist here at SMEC. If you have a stereotype in your mind that data scientists are brilliant, then Catherine will not disappoint you. She is a fountain of knowledge, disciplined and scientific, as you might expect, and also incredibly creative in her thinking, which is so important. We catch up about some current projects she's working on and then dive into CLV, Customer Lifetime Value. What is it? What are approaches to calculating or modeling it? How can we use it in an e-commerce setting? We talk cohorts, categories, and KPIs. All right, let's get into it. Cool. So, Catherine, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Tell us, tell us a bit about yourself. What are your skills? What themes, um, what themes interest you? Uh, <laughs> my skills, yeah. Having fun falling into rabbit holes of data and machine learning and uh, learning about our domain and all these kind of things, but uh, maybe making it more concrete. I'm a data scientist here at SMEC. I'm also the data science ambassador, so I do like to talk about what we do and, and teach people about what we do. Um, I'm mainly working on our shopping ads automation products and the various... Um, ways that uh, we try to help retailers optimize those shopping ad campaigns and uh, get business insights and so on uh, in that domain. And yeah, that's, that's me. Cool. Um, well, I think there's a, there's a lot more to you. Um, <laughs> I, one thing I just want to ask you about, um, I mean, I know you've been really active in, in the data science community. You know, you're active in, in women in AI, female coders. You've done like a TEDx talk. Um, you, then you even wrote, uh, oh, you've got a LinkedIn learning course. Maybe you could tell us about that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm actually not sure if I know the exact topic of that one. I think it's not released yet. And you recently co-authored and edited a data science handbook. So fill us in a little bit. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I have been busy um, with the LinkedIn learning courses. At the moment, I have a course out. It's actually in German. It's all about natural language processing, which is certainly my background and something I, I'm really passionate about. And uh, yeah, watch this space because very, very soon I will be releasing a new course, which is about customer segmentation and customer lifetime value, which I have a feeling we might discuss today. Um, and uh, I have more courses in the works as well. Um, even some programming courses and things like that. And you are right. I, I did uh, contribute a chapter to the data science handbook, the handbook of data science and AI, and was also the editor for this book with a, a big group of authors from the, the Vienna data science group. And yeah, that's, that's already out at the moment in English and German. So yeah, please, everybody who's listening, do check it out. We worked really hard to give a very broad perspective on data science. So we have with 13 different authors in different areas of expertise, there's a, a really comprehensive um, overview and uh, lots of exercises and practical examples and things like that from, you know, the nitty gritty details, like how do certain machine learning algorithms work? to the bigger architectural details, like how do you set up a data-driven business and so on. So even people like managers that aren't necessarily actually data scientists, but they want to understand what the data scientists are doing um, or the, the machine learning stack people are doing, they can look into it. And yeah, on the other side, even beginners can look at the mathematics chapter to learn, you know, the mathematical basics of machine learning and things like that. So yeah, I have been busy, but it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, that's awesome. And which chapter did you author, by the way? I the did do the natural language processing chapter. Okay, very cool. Um, well, you mentioned that you're now working on a LinkedIn learning course about um, <clears throat> customer segmentation, lifetime value. And that's something we decided that we'd really like to talk about today because it's just, it's a hot topic in, in e-commerce. I think it's been uh, popularized a lot in the last couple of years and maybe there's some kind of a, uh, like a Gartner hype cycle here, it's hard to say. Um, you know, is it the holy grail? Isn't it? Um, how, you know, what what are the feasibility challenges there? I think there's a lot to to tackle in in customer lifetime value. But before we get into the the more detailed parts, what is customer lifetime value? Uh, maybe you can lay the grain lay the groundwork for people who are less familiar with it or um, want a refresher. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, the concept is really simple. So it's about 
the total value that a customer will generate for a, a retailer or a brand over the course of their lifetime with that brand. And lifetime uh, means how long they will be a customer with that brand from your first purchase to whenever you decide, nope, this brand is not for me anymore. And, uh, and you move on and you can start by calculating something really simple. So you can think about just the average order value. So the, the transaction values of the, the customers on average times their average purchase frequency, how often are they shopping and then times their average lifespan. So that will give you a, a beginning idea of your average CLV. And then you can um, expand on this, get more sophisticated. For example, you can look at margin rather than just revenue. So instead of looking at your average transaction value, you could look at your average transaction margin and so on. And you can also model this um, in more sophisticated ways and also even try to predict it into the future as well. But that's the basics. Yeah, thanks for, for sharing that with us. And I, I definitely prefer thinking of CLV as a, as a margin or profit metric, mm -hmm. kind of an aggregation of profit. And also, you might you know look at the aggregation of, of marketing costs that are fueling um, that lifetime value and see how these two things play together. Um, so it's really popular to hold in relation to like customer acquisition cost. This, this lifespan part, I don't know if we're getting ahead of ourselves here, but, or so what you've explained, what you've explained there, kind of the, the simple explanation of like, uh, an average order value, um, and a purchase frequency and an average lifespan, let's say you could, you could kind of create a simple calculation, which would be like your, benchmark customer what your really your cut down the middle average customer would be like is that right exactly so that's that that's what you would start with so you might literally start with one number which is what is my average clv and this is a historical number and of course you can't do a ton with that but it's your baseline for improving so anything you try mm -hmm. to do after that if you simply calculate that that uh, formula again it might be very very simple but if it has gone up then you can be happy. And if it's gone down yeah. or stayed the same, then, you know, you have to try something, something different. Okay. But I think you want to get at the, the lifespan problem mm. <laughs> because this is a big problem. Yeah. What is a customer lifespan? And uh, in some CLV models, they are based on a so-called subscription model or a contractual setting where a customer is maybe paying once per month. And this is very, very obvious that they are therefore alive because they're continuing to pay their bills. And then when they call to cancel, it is very obvious that they are uh, not alive anymore. And this is great in, con in contractual settings, in non-contractual settings, which is what most transactions are. So us just shopping on Amazon or shopping in the grocery store or whatever, we don't have a contract. So how can you know that a customer is no longer alive? And this is a very tricky topic. Some you can start again simple as is often always a good heuristic. You could simply look at all your historic data. Hopefully you have a few years worth and not simply one year, and you can figure out the the average time between the customer's first purchase and the last purchase that you have with them in your data set, and you can hope that uh, that is accurate and, and use that to get an average lifespan. Or we can get uh, even more data science -y and start using some probabilistic models, which are based on this idea of, it's basically for every time period, so day, essentially, uh, mm -hmm. every day, a customer is tossing two coins. Will they mm -hmm. buy or not buy today? And will they die or not die? And you can learn these probabilistic models based on your existing data. And then you can do really nice things with that, like predict the future number of transactions for every single individual customer and also predict how likely it is that they are still alive. So you will see, for example, that maybe a customer who made a lot of purchases, but it was six months ago and they've made very few since then, they're quite likely to be not alive. So their alive probability will be low. But maybe a customer who has um, been in your data set for quite a long time and maybe even not purchases often, but purchase more more regularly and more recently, their likelihood of being alive will be much higher. So the probabilistic models will learn this from your data and you can use that to then do predictions. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. So uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding uh, something here, but just a follow up question on that, because like this idea of a coin toss, for example, like a mm -hmm. coin toss, I would understand as as 50 50. So is it like that each day that goes by the, you know, you can you keep flipping tails, this person's dead, this person's dead, that the probability of like 
flipping heads, hey, they're alive, is getting less? Or is it like that the, it's a weighted coin and you yeah. know, it's, it's more like a weighted coin? Exactly. So the probabilistic models will learn for every individual customer what the weights of their coins are because okay. maybe they do shop um, sort of once a week. So uh, then their probability will kind of be one in seven for the buy or not buy. Learning the weights on those coins yeah. and trying to figure out how long these customers are going to stay alive for. It's very interesting, uh, very interesting topic. Um, and there are also other kind of time bound ways of approaching this too, where you're not necessarily thinking about, okay, what is really the, the lifespan? Um, this kind of theoretical lifespan or probabilistic lifespan, but, um, what is the CLV? in 30 days 60 days 90 days and these kind of mm -hmm. function as like cash multipliers or like payback windows different ways of thinking about that mm -hmm. yeah there's different ways that you can look at this so um one of the the, the simpler ways uh is that so let's say we started with this simple formula that i mentioned it's the average transaction value times the frequency times the average lifespan and this will give you one number as an average for all of your customers and the next step of getting more insights is to then do a so-called cohort analysis. Mm -hmm. And this is often done based on the acquisition month of the customer. So basically you group your customers by the first month that they had a transaction in your data set and calculate that formula for those groups. And then you can plot this out. And that's very interesting because then you can start to answer questions like, okay, uh, on average, what is my customer worth to me after three months or six months? So what are they still spending or how often are they spending? And you can also compare the cohorts. So you might find that a customer group that uh, joined you uh, just before Christmas time, maybe they are generating more CLV down the track because, I don't know, you save Christmas and so they love you for it. Or it might be the other way around. They wouldn't normally buy your kind of products, but they have parents and siblings who would. And so actually they just bought once for Christmas and then not, mm. not later on. So you can start to explore that and, and understand and try to reason about, okay, why are my customers who join in the summer? Why are they better for me? Uh, what is it that I did such a great job of in the summer? Because I want to keep doing that. And, and similarly, you, you don't have to use time as your, uh, your cohort clustering factor you could use something like acquisition channel mm -hmm. did their first purchase come from a physical store or online and what difference does that make maybe your physical stores have a really great layout that's guiding customers straight to the checkout and your online store is confusing and slow and whatever the case might be and not producing good clv so you could you know you could look at something like this or did the customer uh, come to you through some discount where maybe you had a discount code for signing up for the first time. And so how do those kind of customers compare to others? So you can do all this kind of thing. And, and yeah, sorry, to, <laughs> getting into the details, as I, as I said, I want to do. Um, this is, you know, one way that you can look at, say, smaller, smaller, uh, timeframes and say, okay, in, mm -hmm. in three months or six months, what's my average customer worth? And another thing you can do is once you start to use, say, these probabilistic models, you can also try to predict in the next N days, 30, 60, whatever, how much revenue will the customer generate for me? So you use these, these same probabilistic models that learn the likely number of transactions uh, and you use a separate probabilistic model that learns about each customer's sort of average spending. And, and then using a combination of those, you can predict the value or you can use just uh, other machine learning methods as well to, to basically get to that. And so to look at the past data, make some features out of this data, train a machine learning model and use that to predict for some time in the past. And yeah, then in that case, you're absolutely not interested in the whole lifespan. You don't know what that lifespan will be, but you are interested in the next few months because you can already make insights uh, and actions from that. Yeah, I mean, that's all really interesting stuff. I think there's a lot to get into there. I, and I love the idea that, you know, your cohorts are not only time-based, but, mm -hmm. um, or you can look at different the time in different dimensions. Like what is the characteristic of that time? Like, just look at Black Friday, for example. Yeah. Super hyped seasonal holiday event. Uh, typically, a lot of people competing on price, offering big discounts. And you know, the question for a lot of a lot of brands and retailers is, should I even play this game? You know, 
is this actually going to you know deliver extra demand for me or is it just consolidating seasonal demand into one highly competitive discounted unprofitable period and looking <laughs> yeah. at to find out with the, with your CLV, you can say, well, what kind of, of people did I acquire? Are they are they actually sticking around, or is it really these very transactional relationships or non relationships? Um, and you can look at other things. Yeah, the like what kind of an offer? Um, you know, when if if people start with offer X instead of offer Y, how how does how does that um, evolve over time? Am I just acquiring if I'm acquiring people on a discount basis? Am I acquiring people who are only going to shop on discount or could this actually work out? And de definitely helping you understand um, your whole promotional strategy and how that, how that works. I think it's so interesting. Yeah. I mean, you just mentioned so many other things that we can talk about. So you, you said, you know, what kinds of people am I acquiring? So, you know, that also triggers in me uh, the demographic data. If you have demographic data about also the location, you could segment customers by this or, or things like that. And yeah, if you really want to, you could maybe look at the first product the customers bought or the, the, the product category that customers most often buy or, or things like this and, and try to, to understand what that means. And it's the, the, the real power then comes of also in the interpretation, because as you said, you might at Black Friday only end up getting customers who are there for the discounts. The Snapchat Jäger, as they say so nicely in, in German, the the, the discount hunters. hunters, bargain hunters, and, yeah. yeah, and that's not necessarily a bad thing because um, some once they've discovered that your store offers a lot of discounts, especially if you are a discount retailer, then maybe that's the start of a wonderful relationship. Um, just because they're they're buying at reduced rates, uh, they might be buying much more often. So mm -hmm. it you you really need to to do a lot of interpretation of of yeah what you find. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, about that, because um, we we're just talking about this demographic dimension, but then there are also kind of just category dimensions or characteristics to customer lifetime value. Um, could you tell us about that a little bit? Yeah. So different verticals and different product types and things you mean? Mm, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Like mm -hmm. if you're, you know, um, in a furniture vertical versus in beauty, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that will definitely have impacts on on what the average purchasing behavior looks like of the customer and, and how that affects the CLV. So in a furniture store, the high CLV customers, maybe they're the ones who uh, they actually only purchase with you once, but they bought everything for their new house. And so they have such a high value that, uh, that they're ending up in, in certain formulas, they're ending up being a high CLV customer. Um, but normally CLV... Uh, places a lot of focus on recency and frequency. So what you might find is is you've got another group of customers who are very often totally revamping their their lounge room. They're going to IKEA and they're buying lots of little small decorations to give their their house a new spring look or something like that. So their purchases are smaller, but they're more frequent, and uh, and they might become high Sylvie customers this way. And yeah, whatever you're selling, you you should interpret the results and, and probably see res, uh, some trends like this. So maybe a, an example we've used before as well is things like makeup. Um, it's normally quite expensive, quite small packages, but they last a long time as opposed to something like a hand sanitizer, which is the same size package, much cheaper, but needs to be refilled much more often. So um, you can try to understand what kind of uh, products people are buying and then I mean, there's lots of users for things like this. So then you can start to do your inventory optimization and so on and say, okay, well, what kind of products do I want? If you've identified your different CLV groups and you've decided, okay, surprisingly, my high CLV customers are the ones who are not buying the most expensive items, but buying them more frequently, then you could try to optimize your inventory to include a lot of those. And of course, it's not just about the revenue. We always have to remember it, it it's margin. So, um, exactly what I just said, but use margins to the revenue and then we're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Perfect. I mean, cause then you'll have, you'll have effects like um, the return rate and, and shipping costs and so mm -hmm. on that, that play into that um, where you might have potentially you've got um, users who um, on a revenue basis would be really high value, but then you actually find that they're driving a lot of costs for you and, 
I, I mean, I think yeah. you'll even hear about uh, brands and, and and retailers who have banned people that they've identified as influencers and not necessarily in the way that they want, where they're just like more or less renting wardrobes and for their for their photo shoots and stuff and just returning them and just kind of abusing the returns policies and stuff like this as an extreme example. But yeah, I mean, uh, that is, I, I didn't even hear of that, but, but you're right. Um, but things like the, the return costs and so on are so important and, and, and it really shows why you have to think about margin and not just revenue because yeah, I'm definitely one for uh, ordering a lot of things online because I, I, I can't get them where I am. And yeah, if things don't fit, you send it back and the retailer bears those costs. And it's not only the return cost, every purchase you have also um, the cost of payment services. So processing my Visa card, for example, you have the cost of delivery services and somebody has to take my return, open it, check the goods are okay, maybe steam clean them to make sure they're ironed again and put them back in the shop. So there are... Uh, so many costs to to be aware of um yeah you're absolutely right um yeah that i i, I think it's just it's really interesting to see the way these things play out and um actually we were talking earlier about you know if you're a brand or you're a retailer how does this play out differently for you because mm -hmm. as a brand you might be um in a single category and so let's say you know you could be in a category like supplements and has a subscription like quality to it in a way it's a very routine purchase ideally um and you're definitely going to be aiming for customer lifetime value whereas furniture it depends or like a mattress let's say uh, people are probably not changing their mattresses too often so they'll have a totally different characteristic but then imagine that you're a generalist retailer and you're selling all kinds of different categories and and how that plays out um, mm. what, what's your take on that yeah, well, again, um, the, the beauty is in the interpretation. I think that the, the general retailers will have a lot of work to do because they have a much bigger assortment. So they will have to, um, try to, to figure out which, which products are being bought by the different customer lifetime value tiers and, and how they feel about that, how they want to deal with that. And that's actually uh, an intense area of research that we're doing right now at SMEC is trying to understand, um, is those, those patterns and, so it's a, it's it's questions like okay, the high value customers, uh, which products are they buying with a higher statistical significance than the low and the mid value customers, and and vice versa for the low value customers, and let's say we identify those high, uh, those products bought by the high value customers, what are we going to do with that? Are we going to just buy more of them? Are we going to uh, put them on on special sales or part of package deals to get more customers to buy them? Are we going to advertise them more heavily in in shopping campaigns. And the answer to that uh, is also dependent on, is this product what's making the customer a high value customer? Mm -hmm. Or does it just happen to be that it is bought often by high value customers? Because what mm -hmm. you really want is to promote the products that are turning your customers into loyal customers. So you can look at those purchase journeys. Uh, maybe the low value customers, do you notice a trend like they're all buying this one product and then there's not many transactions after that. Well, maybe that's a so-called poison product that's, that's really quite bad and, and you don't want to stock it anymore. And, and on the inverse, if you see a, a product that's just um, being bought often by the high value customers or, or maybe even all segments um, and its total revenue is, is just you know, blowing the other products out of the water, then what is so good about that product? And can we get more that are like this? Or yeah, can we bundle it with something else so that people are coming to this product from maybe having clicked an ad for a different product or, or things like this? So yeah, the 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 retailers certainly have um I think more insights to do, to to pour through when mm -hmm. they're doing these kind of analyses. And uh, but the brands are certainly going to still want to optimize for CLV. You're absolutely right with you know these subscription models. This is a great way to already lock people in. Uh, it's very important to to understand like your customer acquisition cost and try to figure out how long it takes on average for you to basically recoup those costs. And so if you can get customers from the get-go as a subscription customer, then that will really help you. And, and that's why, like you mentioned, uh, furniture and mattresses as an example of kind of in op opposition to the subscription model. But I, I'm quite sure I've even heard or read some article about furniture as a service, and there are so many <laughs> products that would not uh, not conventionally be 
subscription products, but they are even things like the, the car manufacturers, BMW, they, they are, it's, it's easier for them to build cars identically. So the physical form of the car is identical, no matter what price range of, of, of model that you buy, but they just will only activate certain features for you if you pay. And so you can pay month by month to have the, uh, the seat heating or seat cooling or things like this. So they're, Stuff yeah, really? as a service is really getting more and more popular in very interesting um, uh, domains, and 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 this is surely one of the driving forces is customer lifetime value. Yeah, yeah, for for sure. Um, and I wonder at what point we'll hit like a, as a service saturation point or something like this. Um, I, yeah. I saw BMW gain a bit blasted um, about that that topic on Twitter. I don't know where else, but I mean, it's kind of it's kind of genius. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, they even these days, well, we're getting a lot off topic here, but you know, there are appliances where they manufacture them um, redundantly with extra pumps mm. in place because they know that, you know, this pipe, this pump is going to, um, is, is likely going to malfunction after X thousand cycles. And then there's a fresh one just ready to rotate into place. <laughs> but <laughs> the, the BMW example is, is a little wild. Um, it, mm -hmm. And it gets interesting too on the secondary market. Um, what happens when you buy a car um, because in a used car and it's got this thing in place? But um, but anyway, we don't we don't need to go too far. That's that that's it sounds like a topic for another podcast because that's a very great point and it's, and it's really interesting. <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. So, um, what are what are some of the uh, are there use cases or, or action ways to make this actionable that you haven't mentioned yet that you'd like mm -hmm. to mention, or do you think we've covered that? Uh, well, so we touched on things like understanding how the customer journey and the demographic affects CLV. And, and of course, the use case of that is then trying to improve that, whether that means you realize your online customers are not checking out as often as they should, so you can fix the website and things like this. This is one use case. And we can push this even further. If you have identified customer segments and, and for example what they purchase then you might get a feeling for what they need and want for you and especially if you're a brand you can use that to inform your product development because mm -hmm. you can you know try to develop products that they that they um, appreciate more or the same for their services um, of course there's the big topic of marketing you know personalized marketing uh, if you know that your customer is uh, for example in a potential brand ambassador group because you know I've, I've mentioned high low and medium clv a couple of times but that's just to keep it simple you could uh in there are different methods that allow you to build sort of as many different groups as you want with really salient titles like new and emerging or mm -hmm. uh yeah potential loyalist or brand ambassador brand hero and so you can try to think of say marketing or service strategies to push people along that pipeline so a potential loyalist you give them some fantastic discount and maybe a, a refer a friend bonus and suddenly they become a brand ambassador and, and things like this. So you can basically try to improve the experience for both your customers and yourself. Um, what else is there? Uh, we already talked about, you know, knowing what to spend on customer acquisition is very important. Um, and a related topic is so preventing churn on the one hand. So identifying that a customer maybe has a, that the, the predicted number of future transactions is low. Maybe the predicted likelihood of being alive is low. You can try to engage that customer to bring them back from the, the brink of churning. But on the other hand, you might even fire some of your customers. Not mm. actually, but you might <laughs> stop sending them the fancy discount emails and so on. I'm sure that uh, Pete and Kloppenberg would do the same to me <laughs> if they knew uh, how I was spending. So you you can really try to narrow it down to, to, to your best customers um, mm. and build a better relationship with them. Uh, and, and one final uh, example coming off the top of my head is just quite a practical one, just anticipating your revenue inflows. Because, you know, if you can predict that all your customers, they will spend this much in the next... Um, X amount of time, then you get a feeling for the revenue to expect, but also, of course, the the demand to expect. So, which products will they buy? Which products do you need to get back into stock, and so on? Yeah, I, I like that idea about all your customers because you can, um, <clears throat> you know, you can kind of aggregate this, and you've got customer equity. What is the the customer lifetime value of all my of the entire customer base? It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, 
if very high level and theoretical, but that, that brings me to some, you know, what about some, what are maybe some kind of pitfalls or challenges mm-hmm. to uh, customer lifetime value? Cause I think there are customer lifetime value naysayers out there too. Um, you'll hear statements like that brands died holding their breath, waiting for a customer lifetime value to materialize. Um, or, you know, you'll hear that maybe, um, customer lifetime value is is too fixed of an attribute and not that not that able to be influenced there's different criticism out there and it's, and it sounds like potentially a lot of work too so tell me maybe i'm already spitting out some pitfalls but tell me what do you see what are challenges here or respond to stuff that i've said either way mm-hmm. yeah sure yeah i mean maybe to the naysayers who who say like ah uh, you know you're you're dying waiting for it to come and stuff like that and as i've mentioned a couple of times you can start simple uh, and and already start to get a bit a bit of an idea. So as with so many data science heavy projects, you don't have to wait for the the full on perfect neural network based artificial intelligence solution. Um, that's extremely um, important to be to be aiming high. But but you should always start simple. So maybe some of those naysayers uh, just started too ambitiously and mm-hmm. and didn't have the resources to. Uh, to get there because the fact is it is a bit of a tricky topic and especially if you are trying to get into it let's say maybe you're you're more of a marketer at your company and you want to see if you can calculate clv for yourself there are certainly tutorials out there that will try to tell you how to do this whether it's in excel or some basic machine learning or things like this but what I, what what we found from our initial research on this topic and so on is that some some of these tutorials they basically say nothing they're not useful at all And others, you know, they do try to actually show you some code and how to implement it, but they follow bad data science practices. They don't explain the statistical assumptions of the models you're using and things like that. And and those are, whatever the topic, they are pitfalls that you certainly can die on. Um, So that's that's one problem. Um, Another really, really crucial factor is to get good data and understand it properly. So... You need, say, transaction-level data where you have for each customer, for each day, what did they buy? But you can't just throw this into a model. You need to understand it semantically. So uh, we've seen customers where they have a lot of discounts, which are recorded as as if they were a normal product. And this can really uh, throw a spanner in the works of your machine learning models because those discounts usually, they're they're things like 50% off your most expensive item or 10% off if you spend more than 70 euro or things like that. And so arguably they've generated an incremental value for the retailer because they've encouraged the customer to spend that little bit more. You can never be sure of this because maybe the customer would have spent that anyway. So you'd need a whole new field of machine learning called causal analysis to try to figure that out. But let's assume that they do deliver an incremental value. That's fine. But the dollar value in that row of that database will be zero because it's just a discount and this will mess up the model. So you need to understand the data and talk to the, the, the domain experts as well and have clear business decisions about how are we going to handle this or how will we calculate our cost? Will we just start by subtracting the cost of goods sold from the unit price of the item? That would be, you know, something basic or will we, add those costs, like, as I said, the cost of delivery services of, or the cost of payment services. And, and even this can be really tricky because not only is it sometimes hard to get that data, it's in, it's in different locations in the, in the company, the retailer, but there are even fun things like the unit cost to the retailer is not known until after the fact because maybe after they sell 10,000 units, they're going to manufacture mm-hmm. a discount. Mm-hmm. So imagine trying to back apply that to the individual customer transactions to get the cost. It's it's really really tricky. So um that is something that you need to keep in mind or another example I've seen in practice is service customers versus product customers. So if you happen to sell both, then things like the 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 transaction value can be wildly different. So the items, if it's just a, a purchase of items, it's you know this much. And if it's a service, it's hundreds or thousands of euro. And this can massively skew the models. And then you might decide, okay, should I treat these as separate groups of customers, which is maybe twice the work, but more actionable? Or do I keep it all in there together? Or if you have business 
and everyday retail customers all in one data set, you will also probably see hugely skewed data and, and that can be tricky. So that's, that's another problem. And a final problem I would say is to be clear about how you will use the CLV insights. So yeah, it's fun to build a model and make some prediction, but what are you going to use it for? And you as a retailer, do you need a prediction or is it sufficient to have just a back calculation for now? A good one, like you want some solid insights, but um, do you really need to try to estimate the future or can you already get some insights out of uh, what has happened in the past? And what about uh, the actual output of the CLV? Do you want a dollar value for the for every single customer? Or do you need it to be in segments? Because maybe you only have the capacity to make targeted marketing strategies for three or five different segments. If you need segments, how will you segment the customers? Do you want to take just a Pareto principle of, okay, my top 20% of my uh, CLV customers and then the next 30% and then the rest? Or do you want to apply more data science to this to maybe do some unsupervised learning to discover the clusters that are really in the data? This is something that you need to to be clear on, and and this is why you know having having a big data science team and some domain experts working together is is really really important. And these are definitely the challenges, but also for me, that's what keeps my job interesting. So it's fun. <laughs> well, thank you for for running uh, running through all that with us. I mean, <clears throat> big big challenges indeed, but um, it's just something that we need to apply ingenuity, effort, resources, and. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the question is, does it become out of reach for certain sizes of business? Um, is it too, you know, is it too scary to touch for, for some businesses? Um, and to, to me, a, a good compromise there um, is that you can realize a lot of the value of moving to a profit-based metric like customer lifetime value by just starting with profit. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that for somebody where or CLV might feel like too big of a project, then then looking at something like profit is a way to realize a lot of that value. You'll be only looking on a single order basis and not, you know, um, so you'd, you'd arguably underinvest, I guess. And yeah, but I think there's also, you know, then that you're not going to overinvest too, which is important for, for businesses um, sometimes too. But I want to know what, what other stuff are you, are you working on these days? Um, you, what what other topics are you and the data science team working on besides customer lifetime value? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, ten, uh, directly attached to CLV is how we can actually use it and get value to it. So, and these are big enough areas that they become topics in their own right. So, as I said, we're doing a lot of work on trying to understand what different CLV segments actually buy and mm -hmm. how you could use that for optimization. So, you know, for example, uh, we all heard about like e uh, the performance max new campaign type from Google and it's make mm. we are working on our enhanced performance max to really make the most out of that. And so how could we, for example, use these insights from CLV to help our clients optimize their performance max? So that's this is one topic. Um, and very similarly, we have competition insights, which is about understanding who are my competitors? Am I more or less expensive than them in total? When are they more or less expensive? So how, how often are they changing their prices? How should I react to this? And um, what is the price elasticity of my products? So maybe uh, another competitor has a slightly cheaper product, but the price elasticity, which is about how sensitive customers are to change in prices, maybe it's quite low for this product. And actually, I don't need to undercut myself and reduce my uh, price just to match that competitor. Uh, and then maybe there are other products where I absolutely do need to be competitive and, and offer a discount because the price sensitivity is, sensitivity is high for this, for this product. So competition insights and, and understanding uh, price elasticity is, is another topic uh, that's very important to us. As I said, I personally am working heavily on basket insights, which is about understanding the, the, the purchasing journey of customers from when they made a click to when they made a purchase, because you would be amazed at how often the clicked item is not in the final basket or it's there, but there are other things in there instead. And it's not just interesting to know what, uh, what products are being replaced by other products, but it's interesting to think about the revenue of those because you might be paying a lot for the ad click 
of this clicked item. And actually, on average, it's getting replaced in the basket by some other item with a much lower revenue. So that's really important for retailers to know so that then they can maybe advertise that final bought item more aggressively instead, or they can discover which products are leading to purchases that involve multiple products and and therefore they can see that as a so-called order opener and promote that with that in mind or make bundles and advertise mm-hmm. bundles that include that product and some others so we are trying to you know mis- use machine learning and so on to learn rules about okay if bread is bought how likely is it that milk or eggs are also bought and and things like that uh, mm-hmm. this is really really interesting that's uh keeping me busy to uh, these days and we have other team members that are working on things like incrementality testing, which is also super important because you and I, we've talked so much today about how can we action these insights? How can we make changes? And mm. you, that's, that's great, but you want to be able to verify for yourself that those changes made a positive impact. And that's what you need the incrementality testing for. You need to be able to know or, or run some kind of easy test where you make the change and you verify the impact that that had. And so we want to um, offer that, uh, offer a service where, where clients are able to do that. And, and, and marketing mix modeling is, a, is another topic where, you know, how can I optimize these kind of activities across different channels and so on. So, yeah, these are just some of the topics uh, that we're working on at the moment. We're, we're lucky enough to have a very big team. So we have lots of things uh, on the go. And mm-hmm. it's it's a pretty exciting time for us. It, it definitely sounds that way. Um, I, I'm <laughs> I'm like fl- flooded with with inputs here. <laughs> um, I mean, <laughs> just to, uh, boy, to like this topic about Pmax, for example. I mean, it would be so attractive or interesting. It it, it sounds nice that you could, um, you know, build audience audiences based on CLV or RFM lists or something like this and feed it to a campaign type like performance max. But then the tricky thing is that the algorithm is, um, or rather the, the way the audience signal is interpreted by Google, it's open-ended. It's not like it's going to, I mean, it's good and bad. It will find people that look like that. It feels problematic to me that, you know, the part Google knows a lot about those, about those users and, and who they might look like and so on and attributes that they have, but they don't know arguably the most important part, which is the customer lifetime value, because Mm -hmm. um, it feels to me then like, yeah, it's like when you start playing something on Spotify or whatever music streaming app. And, you know, after a while, the music is drifting away from what you originally had in mind. Uh, There's Mm -hmm. some kind of a drift that occurs where it's like, you know, I might have given a song thumbs up because it was uh, a country song and my my girlfriend would have given the song a thumbs up because it's romantic but without the algorithm getting these inputs or, or knowing this it feels problematic uh mm-hmm. do, do you see it the same that that um like how well do you think that google could target on the basis of a list like that and provide users with that attribute that you actually want yeah, you're right. The The biggest problem I see is that, that, as you said, Google will find customers who look like these customers. So, you know, if you happen to provide an initial list where it, it says, these are my high value customers, then Google will target similar ones. But what makes those customers similar? Let's say, you know, imagining the information that Google has about them, uh, they all use iPhones, they all live in this region, they're all a certain um, age, gender, things like this. That might be what makes them look similar, but that's probably not what makes them a high CLV customer because your interests are, you know, it's not that all men are interested in one thing and all women are interested in another thing or people of, of all the same age are interested in the same things. So what makes them a high CLV customer, I think, is is not present in those signals that, that Google has. And therefore, what what retailers should be trying to do is, you know, bring in the extra data that that they have that Google doesn't, uh, to be able to, yeah, better better identify things like the you know the customers they want to target and the products that they want to target to those customers, and uh, basically make up for what Google can't see. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's it's very important to bring in this this off channel data and. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, then another way of you, you know, there's kind of that demographic side of of the CLV um, challenge, and then there's also which, you know, you could provide potentially through an audience list, but it feels like slippery. But then there's also the product side, and then you can cluster products based on their association with CLV and serve them in that way. So that mm -hmm. that feels to me like a more currently a more feasible way um, within a campaign type like that, like that, just to get mm -hmm. into, into one campaign type. But. Yeah, for sure. I mean, ultimately in your campaigns, you, you are trying to decide how much to spend on a click for any given item. So understanding how that item contributes to your, your CLV is, is, is absolutely vital. <laughs> and there's so many other things you mentioned earlier that I would love to get back to, but <laughs> my Next memory's time. just not that good. Yeah. I mean, basket insights, uh, I'm, I'm in love with this topic, this whole click versus bottom. I'm, it's so fascinating. And again, there's something because like, you know, CLV isn't solving for isn't solving for the basket composition exactly like you were talking about earlier. You could have somebody who furnished their whole house um, once and they score very high in in kind of one dimension, but then you've got other people where they're buying lots of decoration or um, accessories or so on, or they're frequently uh, making more frequent purchases and they're smaller, but they still end up scoring well in terms of their mm -hmm. lifetime value. For two totally different reasons, but then if you get into the, this, you know, the basket uh, composition, I think it's also really interesting when you look at orders or baskets um, in the profit dimension. Where, um, yeah, you know, you you can target based on clicks or based on products. Like there's a, a product that is going to be click attributed, but then it will result in an order that is totally different. And also there, the average order value might not always be entirely um clear or, or like a good a good indicator because somebody could buy the same thing in three size variants and two color variants and they're only planning to keep one the rest are going to be returned and you can try to absorb that to a certain extent with your business model you know and you can feed that information to other systems but you know understanding what's going on with your baskets and how the channel is optimizing and reporting on this click basis versus how your business is actually developing on an order basis. It's this huge, fascinating area in between there. Yeah, it's it's we have um you know we've we've got these beautiful dashboards that that show these journeys that show the flow between you know the categories that are clicked and the categories that are bought or on a brand level or on a product level. And and it's sometimes so surprising what happens. Uh, you know, the clicked item is women's sports shoes and the bought item in the end is uh, men's jackets or something mm -hmm. and uh, so then you really wonder who is making this purchase and it shows you if anything that it's not safe to make assumptions about the customer based on the item that was clicked because yeah it could mm -hmm. be someone buying presents for someone else or something like this um so yeah or maybe it's just maybe it tells you something about your website so the the banner ad that you have for your men's jackets is just so overpowering that it's pulling everybody away. And maybe that's great if it's a better margin product, but uh, mm. if it was, then probably you should have just advertised that one more directly. And if it's a lower margin product, then this is bad and should be fixed. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Cause there's other, you know, you could also lead in with a brand product because it's going to get more search volume, more mm -hmm. clicks and so on. And then, have a strategy on page to switch them over to your proprietary brand where you've got a better margin. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we've talked a lot about customer lifetime value here today and, you know, kind of teasered into other areas about the way that your inventory is so complicated and fascinated and your customers are so complicated and fascinated and the way these two things intersect just becomes explosively complex, but also um, a lot of potential insight hidden in there and uh for those bold enough to go get it <laughs> yeah um, absolutely but Catherine, hey thanks so much for joining us is there anything else that, that you want to mention before we before we head out of here or no, i would just say that uh yeah all of these topics we talked about today are really both fascinating and very very useful so i do encourage retailers to to start thinking about these and you know of course i am a data scientist so i would tell you start thinking about your data as i always say think about what you have what insights you might be able to get out of it 
get some advice, get some help, because as I mentioned, it's, it's easy in a tutorial. It's often not so easy in the real world. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, have, have fun with it. And I wish everybody lots of success in doing so. Well, great note to end on. Thank you for joining us, Catherine. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Likewise. Thanks for listening to Growing E-Commerce. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please consider sharing it with coworkers, friends, or within your professional network. We really appreciate it. This podcast is produced by Smarter E-Commerce, also known as SMEC. To learn more, visit smarter-ecommerce.com.